Assalamu alaikum and welcome back to English uh, Poetry. Before I begin today uh, talking about Shakespeare's uh, Sonnet 18, let's have two of your classmates here talk about uh, Palestinian features in poetry, Tamim poem, and then we'll have Noha talk about, recite one of her uh, parodies. Come here, please. Go on. Um, since um, um, the, uh, poetry is a language of expressing the feelings. So it is the perfect way for the writers or the Palestinian writers to write about their anger and desire of making their land free. So today I'm, talk I'm going to talk about uh, one feature of, uh, of the Palestinian uh, poetry or literature. Um, what I searched, uh, I have many features, but what I want to, to talk about is the illusion, uh, the illusion um, of using people that represent the deep history of the city as a Palestinian and Arab uh, and Muslim city. So uh, the, the line is, or the lines, في القدس مدرسة لمملوك أتى مما وراء النهر. باعوه بسوق خاصة في أصفهان لتاجر من أهل بغداد وأتى حلبا. فخاف أميرها من زرقة في عينه اليسرى فأعطاه لقافلة أتت مصر. فأصبح بضع بعد بضع سنين غلابا مغولا وصاحب السلطان. This is an allusion for the uh, king uh, of the Hill Papers, who was the king of uh, a Mabluk country, uh, which was containing of Egypt and Levant. Um, so this king and this great leader of the Muslim uh, Muslim uh, uh, Muslim armies, uh, he was at the first of his life. He was just a poor little uh, slave who was just bought and sold and bought and sold. And once he want, was bought to uh, a prince. And this prince just rejected him because of a uh, 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 defect in his eye. Uh, there was like a blue or a white uh, point in his eye. So he was rejected and he sent him back to that uh, trailer. Then uh, Malik uh, Salih Ayyub uh, bought him. Uh, and he, then he uh, was like, uh, um, he was admired and he liked mm -hmm. this uh, little uh, boy, and then when he grew up, he made him, he made him free and made him uh, a prince, and then he became the king. So? So this is an allusion, so that makes uh, uh, us to, to uh, think about the deep and long history of Jerusalem as an Arab country. So we have history and deep, deep history to think about it. So that is my Okay, answer. thank you very much. <laughs> Invoking the past alluding to uh, people from the past seems to be one feature of Palestinian poetry. I really wish that more of you would be talking about more uh, features, but let's see Nuha here talk about, uh, recite her uh, parody. Go on, please. Okay, so uh, we all know Sir Tom Le and Thomas White's uh, poem, uh, or sonnet, let's say, who sold us to hunt. Uh, today I try to modernize it a little bit and, uh, okay, let's hear it. Whoso less to laugh, I know where is a mean. But for me, alas, I may no more. The vain laughter hath wearied me so sore. I am of them that laugh their heart and scream. Yet may I by no means in my wearied dream, while trying to my vain heart to find a cure, I pause. Hands type friends. La and laughter takes the floor, and in calamity I find myself no more. Whoso less to laugh, irritated they might seem, were left by someone who, uh, who they abhor with two blue ticks, scre ticks screaming seen. Smelly cat can, all, can cure them for sure. For you, Nagi, taught me to be cautious. Though I might seem in despair, yet I am humorous. Thank you. Okay, nice. <laughs> nice connection between friends on their 25th anniversary and an ancient poem, Smelly Cat. Okay, ladies, we'll go here to Shakespeare and Sonnet 18. <clears throat> uh, I know some of you don't feel comfortable with Shakespeare. I don't think this is normal, but it's it's your choice, it's your opinion. I don't uh, want to uh, force you to like Shakespeare or not like Shakespeare, but let's see his poetry, his writing. 
let's see his, uh, we'll study two of Shakespeare's sonnets. And at least if you will still uh, not like Shakespeare, let's appreciate him a little bit. Let's see what he did and how he did what he did. Because what Shakespeare did is unprecedented. Shakespeare wrote 140 sonnets. In addition to the sonnets in the plays, in the uh, 37 give or take plays he already he wrote. Shakespeare is said to be one of the greatest figures of humanity, human civilization. He's said to be the greatest poet of all times. Some people might agree or disagree here, but undoubtedly many, many people. I assigned other classes to go ask their family members, their parents, if they ever heard of Shakespeare. And the answer was mostly yes. How? We don't know, nobody knows. Even some illiterate people have heard of Shakespeare. And this in itself is fascinating. This man from a small town in the UK. Shakespeare's works have been adapted and adopted and appropriated and acted all over the world. His works, his sonnets and plays have been translated into almost every language on earth. And I usually quote one critic who wanted to show how great Shakespeare is by saying that at any time of the day, there is somebody out there talking about Hamlet, thinking about Hamlet, researching Hamlet, reading Hamlet, watching Hamlet, reciting Hamlet, soliloquizing Hamlet, appropriating Hamlet, cursing Hamlet, researching Hamlet, rehearsing Hamlet, acting Hamlet, producing Hamlet. And that's only Hamlet, one play. According to Harold Bloom, the American critic, a fascinating man, he has a book called Shakespeare and the Invention of Humanity or human being. And this is, this guy, like he loves Shakespeare to, to, to insanity and back. Not because of who he, like the man, but what he did. And he claims that we live in the shadow of Shakespeare. At least in Western civilization, people live in the shadow of Shakespeare and his characters and his poetry. And he says the most uh, quoted man in Western civilization, Christendom, is Jesus Christ. And the second most quoted person is, is Hamlet, and Hamlet, Hamlet, and Hamlet is a fictional character. Meaning probably Shakespeare is more quoted than, than, than Jesus Christ. Anyway, we'll talk about his, his poetry today, but before we do so, uh, I, I want to ask you a question. Do you think great people, like people we consider great nowadays, like Arab poets, Mutanabbi and Antara, English poets and dramatists like Shakespeare, John Donne, Marlowe, uh, Samuel Johnson, Dryden, Ben Johnson, uh, Milton, do you think those people realized how great they were? Do you feel that when great people did great things in all forms, walks of life, literature, art, science, did they feel that they were great, that they will be great one day? What do you think? Please. Uh, some of them uh, feel like this, that Shakespeare in this summit, the last two lines expresses how great Shakespeare is. Yeah. And they feel that they are great because they did the last two lines expresses how great Shakespeare is. Okay. So when you read Shakespeare, you see the confidence that could tell that he at least knew something, that he is not an ordinary person. Actually, he was ac appreciated, but compared to now, it was nothing. Yeah. It doesn't mean uh, they disliked him. He had bestsellers, like so many uh, 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 of his plays were performed again and again and again and again. And we're talking about London with small number of, of population compared to what we have today. But yeah, definitely. Some people hated Shakespeare. You know, rivalry, people doing the same thing at the same time, some critics. Uh, but, and, so, what's that? Yeah, there's that TV show, uh, the, the Startup Crow. That, that is fantastic. Sorry. There is a person who 
person who called him that. The critics of the Tariq. The critic called Green. Yeah. The, the thing is that uh, everybody, every successful person would have people to hate him, to hate his guts. But the point is, this could be part of the fuel, part of how you uh, become who you are. I think that most of the people, uh, most of the great people do not really recognize how, how great they are until, like, until after their death, after people <coughs> come uh, centuries later and realize how, what great deal their, uh, their act did in future. Mm -hmm. Because like we said before that most of the romantic poets were not really famous at their age and people considered them some kind of like the revolutionary act was not really uh, the mainstream, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And another thing, uh, talking about like the confidence in maybe Shakespeare's poem, I believe that this is the persona talking, not Shakespeare himself. Maybe, like, this is my own point of view. Okay, so tastes change, trends change, people change, and this is how how life works. What people like today might not be liked in the future and vice versa. We'll see with John Donne, he, for like 200 years, he was almost forgotten. For a reason or, or another, we're going to understand this. But definitely, I think we will find something, some traces, some evidence in Shakespeare where he is looking into the future and declaring that he will live forever and ever. In many of his sonnets, actually, because it's 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 a main theme in his sonnets. Like, I, I will make you immortal by, by writing that. Okay, so this is uh, uh, sonnet number eighteen, and I already revealed the secret that this is a sonnet, and which is not a secret because we can all count until uh, twenty uh, tw until uh, fourteen. Now, uh, uh, the sonnets, most poems in the past did not have titles, by the way. Even Arabic uh, poetry, most of the titles we see, we use, are used by later critics. Or sometimes they're given, the sonnets are usually given uh, numbers. And sometimes we use the first line or part of it to name uh, the sonnet. So this is sonnet 18, or shall I compare thee? Or shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Now, we already spoke about one major category of the sonnet, which is the Italian sonnet, sonnet by Petrarch. Yes. We spoke about Before. the theme being love, love, basically courtly love. Form. Uh, form. The form being okay. uh, a line. Octave. Octave. octave plus sestet, eight lines, Six lines. The rhyme scheme being A B B A A B B A and C D C D C D C D E C D E. A variety of sestets. Let's see Shakespeare. Somebody please read. Yeah. To a summer's day, don't eat any of the, uh, the syllables here. I know you're hungry, maybe. Thank you. One more, please. Could you speak up? Speak up. Thou. Sometimes too hot 
what the eye of heaven shines, and often is his bold conviction dim, and every fearful face and time defines, by chance or nature's changing course and trend, but thy eternal summer shall not fade, nor lose position of that way thou owest, nor shall the bread thou wanderest in his shade, when in eternal lies time thou grows, so long as men can feel and eyes can see, so long lives, lives this and this is life to be. Okay, thank you. One more finally. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Up. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more tempered. Rough winds too shake the darling ones of May, and summer's lease has all too short a day. Sometime too hot the eye of heaven shines, and often is his gold complexion dim, and every fair from fair sometime declines, by chance or nature's changing course and trim. But thy eternal summer shall not fade, nor lose position of that fair thou owest. <coughs> Nor shall death grab thou wanderest in his shame, when an eternal line to time thou growest. So long as men can, can breathe or eyes can see, so long lives this, and this gives life to me. Okay, thank you very much. Now, before I attempt to recite it, what do you notice about the text? Did you hear different readings? Yes. Yeah. The syllables? Yes. And the, like, what did you notice, for example? And the oh, can you compare, like, who read what? I this way. Mm -hmm. But you didn't notice the differences like somebody read oast, somebody said oast, somebody said gross, somebody said growest, somebody said temperate, somebody said temperate, somebody said temperate. Okay. It all makes a difference here. Because when we talk about the sonnet, it's not only fourteen lines quatrain, quatrain, quatrain couplet or octave, sestet, etc. We'll see how in, 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 the, uh, in the sonnet, in the Shakespearean sonnet particularly, the number of syllables are also counting because we'll find 10 syllables each. 154 sonnets, that's basically more than 2,000 lines. And almost all of them have 10 Syllables. Can you count the syllables, somebody? Can you help me count the syllables, please? No, okay. So, how do you count the syllables? How do you know how many syllables there are, please? Thank you very much. Every vowel sound, we're talking about sounds rather than letters. The same with the rhyme scheme, the rhyme. We, we care about the, the, the sound rather than the. Oh, so, every uh, uh, vowel sound is a syllable. So, shall I compare the to a summer's day? How many? Fair. Okay, number two, please. Thou art more lovely and more temperate. Ah? Temperate. How many in temperate? You said temperate. You, you gave it two syllables. Two syllables means this is nine. This is nine. So, how many syllables in, t in this word? Temperate. Temperate. With the schwa, still temperate. Okay. So, still. Ten. And with lovely, we don't say lovely. Lovely. Because the stress is on the root. Lovely. Two syllables. What about this E? We don't say it. We don't pronounce it. And then, number three, please. When do say the darling word of name? So, if you count, we don't have all the time in the world to count, you'll realize that each line has ten syllables. Meaning? Five feet. In English, not all, not all feet consist of two syllables, but most feet, especially the iambic pentameter, we have two syllables, one foot. Foot in Arabic means tafila. 
And the fourth consists of two syllables, basically, syllables, sometimes three syllables. But here it's two syllables. And it's called iambic because the first one is unstressed, like this. This is like the U in unstressed. And this is like a stressed syllable. And this goes like 90% of the time. Shall I compare thee to Asa Mazde? Thou art more lovely and more titum, 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 titum. But it's not a perfect uh, uh, scansion sometimes. And why Shakespeare deviates is also a matter of, of question. Now, I want somebody to, uh, again, tell me what other things you notice in the text. Please. Okay, let's do the rhyme scheme. I want somebody to come here, come here to, to do the rhyme scheme. Hmm. Somebody, the rhyme scheme. Do you know how to do the rhyme scheme? You should know how to do the rhyme scheme. You should always, when you comment on a poem, do the rhyme scheme. And this is step number one. And then after that, I want you to connect the rhyme scheme with the, the structure itself. Could you come here, please? You want to come here? Yes. So... The first sound is A, so we give it A. Right? This is how you do it. Okay. Okay, wait, wait a minute. Tell us why. Why do we have the A? Is it because the line ends in A? Look at them and explain why, why did you go for A? Not, why not B, C, D? I like, I like Z. It's a beautiful sound. It looks like this. Why A? O was start A. Okay, so the first line is always given A. But still, why? Where did you get it from? What's your name? Nisreen. Okay, there's no A in Nisreen. So why, why didn't you go for N? It's a more beautiful letter than A. Why A? Where did you get it from? Okay, after A, where do you usually go? D, X, Y, Z? Why? Where did you get A, B from? That's it, from the alphabet. So, D, not because the sound is A, but always the first sound, the first rhyme in any poem is A, we take it from the alphabet. And then, what happens next? So day and then temperate, are they the same? No. Wait a minute. If they are the same, we give it again A. And there's no problem in repeating the sound. But temperate, we usually focus on the vowel sound, the last sound or two sounds sometimes. So temperate is not like day, but may, is like this, so we give it the same letter already. A, B, and then date. Are you sure? Are you, wait, are you sure? No, no, no. Are you sure that this is B? Don't look at me, look at the here and try to read it. Why did you write B? Why not C? Why not D? Why not E? Why not A? Alphabet A, B, A, B. Okay, A, B, A, no. Alphabet is A, B, A, B. A, B, C. So you're going for A, and then because the sound is different, you go for B. And then because this sound repeats this sound, you go for B. Exactly. Exactly, okay. I know you're having the stage fright, but this is not... Okay, so A, B, A, B. Thank you very much. Somebody else? Come here, please. Okay. Do the second part. The word shines, we will give it C. Wait, wait a minute, because it ends with the S letter? No, because in the alphabet it, it comes after A, B, C. But I think I want to add A. It's more beautiful than C. Different from what? From date and May. Thank you very much. So we have already 
two different rhymes, May day and May, A, A, temperate and date, B, B, and then we have shines, totally different. We go to the alphabet, A, B, C. Listen, whatever poem you scan, like you read for uh, uh, the rhyme scheme, make sure at the end that the, the, the letters read in the order they are in the alphabet. If you jump a letter, you're doing it wrong. If you skip a letter, you're doing it wrong. If you miss a letter, you're doing it wrong. So at the end of the day, it's like you have A, B. If you have a new sound, you don't go for E. Go for C because it comes after B. Okay, so C. Uh, we have the word uh, we'll give a What's that? What's, what's the word? Dimmed. Dimmed. D. Uh, the word uh, decline, same as shine. Very so good. We'll give it C. Uh, in trim. Untrimmed. Untrimmed. We'll give it D because it's same as. Very good. Thank you. Someone else? One more. Please come here. Now, some might insist that dim, untrimmed, fade, there is a lot of similarity here, true. But we understand that this is Shakespeare. So some, some people might want to repeat that D, D here with fade, shade. Not because it ends with a D sound, but because there's a similarity. But actually, with the vowel sound, a, d, a little bit different, like 50% at least different from uh, dimmed and untrimmed. So we go for. If we want to give the letter D, it would be some kind of like imperfect triumph. So I think I will go with E. Okay, A, E. Okay, I was, uh, S. Shade, so, S. Okay. A, e. And browest, like always. Okay. F. So E, F, E, F, thank you. Finally, somebody. What would you do? Finally. What letter are we at? Okay, with Shakespeare, you should always get to GG. I don't know who she is, <laughs> but you should go there. GG. If, you, if you're doing a rhyme scheme in Shakespeare and you don't go to, get, get to GG, you're most definitely doing a, a, a wrong job. So it's A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, E, F, E, F, G, G. We notice two things here. Number one, this is different from Petrarch. Yes. Not just different, almost totally different from Petrarch. And this is what we call alternating rhyme. Shakespeare doesn't repeat it more than, the, 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 the same sound doesn't repeat it more than twice. And this is more difficult than this. This is more rigid than, than Petrarch, because Petrarch goes for A, B, B, A, and mirrors it yet again, A, B, B, A. With Shakespeare, A, B, A, B, thank you, next. C, D, C, D, C, D thank you, next. E, F, E, F, and finally, the beautiful couplet at the end. The rhyming couplet at the end. Now, when it comes to reading this, or dividing it into parts, we realize that we have four lines, four lines, and then four lines, and then two lines. Meaning this is different from, from Petrarch. So number one, the rhyme scheme is A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, E, F, E, F, G, G. Not G, 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 G. Okay? And then number two, it consists of three quatrains, and a quatrain, it's like from quarter, quarter, rubber, quarter past nine or something. It's one of four parts of something. So we know now we, a couplet means two lines, a triplet three lines, a quatrain four lines, a sestet six lines, an octave eight lines, plus one couplet. Interesting. We've seen the couplet before, but we, let's see who does it better. Now, when we read the poem, to examine other things, the sounds, let's see if the theme matches. Different rhyme scheme, different structure. I think this is deliberate. This is somebody deliberately
planning, wanting to be different from others, to be unique, to be himself, to be Shakespeare. So, shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. Listen. The dictionary here, the Oxford dictionary says temperate. Okay? Not temperate. Some of you say temperate to make it perfectly uh, uh, rhyme with, uh, with date. And in, in these cases, some people might insist that perhaps during the time of Shakespeare, it could have been pronounced temperate as well. Some people might say, let's give it a poetic license and make it more musical. And others might say, no, keep it as it is. Because perhaps there's something here. Because if you go for temperate, the rhyme scheme here could be imperfect. Temperate and date. See, different scenarios. Whatever scenario you like, it's correct. But I want you to think about it. Sorry? Oh, possibly. Yani, this, yeah, thank you very much. Should be the first one is usually the, the fixed thing. But I, I did that way because it, the problem is with temperate, whether it, it is temperate or temperate. So, uh, thou art more lovely and more temperate. Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May, and summer's lease hath all too short a date. Sometime too hot the eye of heaven shines, and often is his gold complexion dimmed, and every fair from fair sometime declines, by chance on nature's changing course untrimmed. But thy eternal summer shall not fade, nor lose possession of that fair thou owest. Nor shall death brag thou wanderest in his shade when in eternal lines to time thou growest. So long as men can breathe or eyes can see, so long lives this and this gives life to thee. You, if you uh, try to listen to this on YouTube, you'll find that some people say oest. This is, by the way, this is o, meaning on, and this is grow. And this is wonder. But in the past, remember we said, with he, she, and it, they used to add th instead of the s we do today for the third person pronoun. So, uh, summer hath, summer has, cometh. And again, some people say, it, like give it two syllables, cometh. Honestly, I don't know why. I want could someone please investigate why some people insist on saying always giving it an extra syllable? And by the way, with the extra syllable, you break the music here. You get, this ends up with, with 11 syllables. I couldn't find an answer. So if you could investigate this, that would be great. Uh, so I would insist on oast, oast and grossed sticking to the 10, the 10 syllables. So again, what's the ST here? This is for you or thou in the past. They would add t or is t sometimes. This is not for the superlative form of the verb, of the adjective, sorry, because the verbs cannot be in the superlative form. Thankfully, this infliction was dropped. We don't have this any longer these days. Thank God. Now, look at the beginning of the poem. Smooth beautiful and sweet because of so many things number one the sound itself the sound itself shall I yeah it's sweet it's poetic yeah shall I that's sadly not many people use shall I these days in in spoken English shall I is basically uh, like we use shall I to offer somebody like shall I help you shall I people these days are more into uh, can I? May, may I is very polite, but can I? Can I help you? Can I help you? And I think the sound shall I is more poetic, sweeter than could I? Can I? And also the question form here, this is a kind of a rhetorical question, a self-answering question. He doesn't say, and this is beautiful from Shakespeare, he doesn't say, I will compare thee to summer's day. If he does this, it, it gives him more authority makes him look like an authoritarian figure, somebody who's giving commands and orders to somebody he wants. And because he doesn't want this somebody, and again, there's a huge discussion on who this somebody is, the recipient of the sonnet. 
Some people say some of them were sent to his patron, the man who supported him socially and politically, the Earl of Southampton, I guess. And some people try to add this to the discussion whether this was uh, a man-man love relationship. And some of the poems were written for a woman nobody knows because Shakespeare married an older woman and probably he was in love. He was in London. The family was uh, uh, back home. And some people say probably all these sonnets were written to a fictional lady or a real lady they describe as the mysterious dark lady. We don't care. We care about the text, but I take it for granted as, like I take it personally as a text written for a woman. So at the beginning he wants to, you know, and this is different from uh, who's soul is to hunt, somebody giving up. This is a man doing his best to make the woman love him, think highly of him. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? And he does it again by the question form, the rhetorical question. He's not giving orders. He's kind of asking, taking permission. And then the sound of shall I is beautiful and sweet. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? And look at the differences in cultures. As Arabs, if this is somebody in Saudi Arabia or Kuwait sending this poem to his beloved, telling her, shall I compare thee to a summer's day? He hates her. Summer is different. And again, this is one of the, the dilemmas with, like, that uh, encounters translators. If you're translating this, what would you say in Arabic? Can you, can you, give, it, can you give it a try? Probably if you have time, try to translate it into, into Arabic and see how would you stick to everything? Would you try to manage some of the, uh, the ideas there? The answer is, of course, there's nobody giving permission. If you imagine the woman being there and nodding or saying yes, but he's kicking her out and erasing her from the text, okay. But you could say that he's just asking and answering because this is a man taking for granted everything, especially women. Thou art. Thou art. Hiya. Again, you are. So this is not art, uh, art and literature. This is art meaning are. Why, why the T? Because of thou. thou. Get used to this. Thou art more lovely and more temperate. You're more beautiful than a summer's day, than a beautiful day of the summer. And this is really sweet. And suddenly, from this kind of sweetness, something changes. Look at the way he begins line three. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? The what more lovely and more timid. All of a sudden, there's rough winds do shake the darling buds of me. Everything changes here because he wants to say, to say that life is tough. Sometimes summer is not good. It's not as beautiful as some might think. So he changes, it changes the sounds here. Shall, sh, sh, sh. These are sweet sounds. Changes to d, d, b, b, shake, do sounds. Like making, you know, trouble, making... Uh, I, 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 mirroring, uh, echoing the sound probably of, of the winds, and they're not ordinary winds. By the way, he could have said the winds. The winds, that's it, the winds. But this is rough winds. Again, do shake. Why do? Why would you say, I did see him? Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, <laughs> In, okay. So without do, we will miss we will miss one syllable. Yes. So Shakespeare is again killing, so to speak, two birds with one stone. So do adds, but this is Shakespeare. He can find a way, uh, and again he makes he emphasizes this: do shake rough winds, do shake. Even though the way you read it is is tough. He adds toughness. The fa sound. The, Rough winds, right? Do shake the darling buds of May, the beautiful small budding flowers of May. And summer's lease hath all too short a date. Summer is too short sometimes. It's when it is beautiful and there's no, you know, wind or storms. It's short. Lease here means period. It doesn't last forever. This is the first idea. Look at how, I don't know, he, there's some kind of, uh, sh like Shakespeare is indicating that everybody, everything is, is not 
uh, doesn't last forever. We're all going to die. Every beautiful thing ends. Some are beautiful, sometimes, but we have rough winds. And sometimes it's not short, too short. And in the second stanza, he does the same thing in other words. Sometimes too heaven, too hot the eye of heaven. The eye of heaven is the sun. The eye of heaven, by the way, he could have said, please again, get used to Shakespeare, because sometimes he goes, like he takes the long shot, short cut, like Roseanne, Roseanne did just now. Instead of saying the sun, he would say the eye of heaven. Some people don't like Shakespeare for this. But we should love Shakespeare for this. Yeah. So, like, look at how different it's going to be. And again, and again this, is, this is poetry. In poetry, the basic element of poetry is the metaphor. Saying things in other words, not going lit, lit, literally. So the eye of heaven shines. Sometimes the sun is too hot. And often is his. So his here is a reference to the sun, by the way. The sun in English is male. In Arabic, it's female. His gold complexion, you know, dimmed. Sometimes it's covered by, by the clouds. So it gets dark. And ev I think this is one of the most beautiful lines ever. And every fair from fair sometimes declines. Look at the repetition of the... And also you can add to them the... It still reminds us of the rough winds. But this is somebody who is really frustrated, somebody who's annoyed, somebody who's not happy with what's going on, with how time changes, how beauty never lasts. This is called an alliteration, the repetition of the same sound. Yes, it adds music, makes it musical, but please always go for the purpose and link this with the tone, the atmosphere. In my opinion, the fa, fa, fa sound uh, uh, indicates somebody who is sad, desperate to, you know, for hope, for change, for something better, for something everlasting, annoyed, frustrated, angry, you know, like why always me? Why do good things die out, fade, decline? And every fair from fair sometimes declines, and please, this is not sometimes, this is not sometimes. Both of them are sometime different, a little bit different from sometimes. What a, a particular time they will decline. Why? Because of chance or nature. By chance, fate, or nature's course. Na course means like track of course. Okay, doesn't mean a course like this course. And nature's course, nature, life moving on forward, untrimmed. Basically, this is a repetition of the first one, in other words, in more creative ways. And the message here is that everybody dies, everything declines, every beauty just fades away. And when we are this close to giving up, he's saying we are doomed, we're all going to die, no, nothing lasts forever. He twists the argument a little bit, giving us a robe, a ray of hope to cling to, and I, lo I love the use of but here, yeah? There's but, so if we're like, oh, yeah, I, I see what you mean, Shakespeare. We are all doomed, we're all going to die. And then, but comes like a wake-up call here. But thy, and this is again thy meaning, your, thy eternal summer shall not fade. The summer I'm talking about is more beautiful, more lovely, more temperate than the ordinary summer here because your summer is eternal. Your eternal summer shall not end. Your summer will remain forever. No lose, you will not lose possession of that fear. You will not lose your beauty, your furnace that you own. Nor shall death brag. Can or does death brag? What's brag? Boast. Boast or show off, you know, suppress pride. Who usually brags about things? 
a human being, a person, a man, a woman. So he's talking about death. In some, by the way, in some poems, you'll, online you'll find it death with a capital D. Sometimes it makes a little bit of a difference. Or small d. I like to go for a small letter here. Because he's treating death, the grand leveler, the mighty thing, as a human being. And this is Shakespeare putting death in its place. Probably declaring that he is bigger than, de than death itself. He's personifying death as somebody who cannot brag because of Shakespeare, because of what Shakespeare does. Nor shall death brag thou wandest in his shade. There is another his, by the way, here. So, so many men, so few women. His refers to death, personifying death. This his refers to the sun, the eye of heaven. Again, Shakespeare means here, you will not die. This means you will not die. But you and you and me, we say we, you will not die. But Shakespeare doesn't say it this way most often. Death shall not brag the wonders in his shade. What? Say again, Shakespeare, what do you mean? I mean, death shall not brag. But I don't know, death is not a human being. And then, oh yeah, you're going for the metaphor. And if you want to understand Shakespeare, try to always go beyond what the words say to the metaphor. And look at this, how beautiful this is. Because we still, why the shift? We don't understand. You just said that we are all going to die, and then you're saying you're not going to die. And then he goes for if. But he doesn't say if because it makes a difference. If is still conditional, uncertain. Hmm. But this is Shakespeare, he's proud, he's, he's certain. He knows he's going to win this woman. So he says, win for more certainty. Win in eternal lines. The eternal lines, the line, not lines, people queuing here, the line of verse, my poetry. Win in eternal lines to time thou grows. And again, I like the word grow. It's not live. If we wrote the poem out here, we could... And, and, and live is, is also a perfect word. Around Shakespeare can easily find a word that would rhyme with, with live. But live, again, is live. Growing is living and getting bigger and more famous and everywhere. It's a perfect choice. When in eternal line, lines to time, thou gross. When you live in my lines, when you come to me, when you like me back, when you agree to be my whatever. Whew. And then he goes for the perfect, perfect uh, couplet. You will not find a more beautiful couplet than this. So long as men can breathe or eyes can see, so long lives this. This is the sonnet, his poetry. And this gives life to thee. Ending it with a hopeful tone. How there's destruction here, yeah? Destructiveness. Beauty is transient. Time kills all. Nature. Ah, rough winds. Too hot. Too short. Too windy. Don't worry. When in eternal lines to time thou growest, so long lives this and this gives life to thee. And I love how Shakespeare is, uh, 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 is like delaying the condition until the, the last line of the, uh, of the third, uh, the third quatrain that has the twist here. Like there was this talk about last week, the differences between sometimes parents and uh, like parents, like mothers and, and fathers. And, and usually we came to the conclusion that usually mothers give uh, uh, the result first, like, you will be good, you will do this, you will succeed, I will give you, I'll buy you, I'll cook you, I'll, you know, if, when. But the fathers usually go for the condition first. So, if you do this, when you do this, I'll give you, this will happen. Here Shakespeare is again being more tactful, more poetic. He's giving, he's tempting here. 
you will have this and this and this. You will live forever. You will grow when you live in my lines. If I make you live in my lines. And again, the, the win here is for certainty. And then Shakespeare again ends with this beautiful, beautiful couplet. So long as men can breathe or eyes can see, so long lives this and this gives life to thee. Possibly the most famous uh, couplet of all times. What is the theme in this sonnet, in this poem? Love, only love. Mortality. Mortality or immortality. Okay, there is mortality, but then there is immortality. There is eternity. Time changing everything, please. Time. Time is a destructive power. Beauty. What about beauty? It's, it's, it gets destroyed by, but it can be preserved by something. What is this something? Poetry. Not any art, by the way. This is Shakespeare's poetry. He knows, yes. He knows that he's going to live forever and ever and ever. Because this here, this, this sonnet, this poetry, is going to live, to live, to live forever. Please. Death. Is he just basically talking about death or is he using death to, personifying death to make a point? It's a means to Now, many people try to understand how Shakespeare came to terms with death. I read this article that says that Shakespeare was frustrated because he knew, he felt that he was a genius, unprecedented literary figure, an intellectual and everything. And he always was like, why should I die? I shouldn't die. Not always, like you'll find this. There is this fear, despair. And sometimes they connect Hamlet with, with Shakespeare himself. The fact that Hamlet didn't want to take revenge was the tiny bit of possibility that he might get killed and he did not want to get killed at some point. So Shakespeare's obsession with death made him write so many things and indicate this in his poetry. How to over, how to outlive death. The result was through his poetry. Through his poetry, by writing. And in drama uh, classes, when you study more about Shakespeare, this is a poetry class, you will, I think, come across the fact that Shakespeare himself uh, gave up writing when he could have written more. And I think this is also one way of Shakespeare trying to conquer death. He wasn't just writing and involved in life and getting busy with the drama and the stage, and then all of a sudden he got ill and died quickly or slowly. He quit, he resigned, and he went back home just to, as if declaring, okay, I'm ready. Anytime, death, you're welcome. I don't care, I've done everything. I've conquered every con uh, co uh, corner of the globe. So, thank you very much. You could say the theme is love, art, but not this art, okay? Poetry, destructiveness of time, yeah? Transience of beauty. Some people might claim that Shakespeare also changed the theme. But, but I don't think so, because this is still a love poem, beautiful love poem. So we could compromise by saying Shakespeare expanded the theme, changed the form, and changed the rhyme scheme. Experimented on everything in the poem. He experimented on everything in the poem expanded the theme, totally changed the rhyme scheme to a more, by the way, to a more difficult, more rigid form, which is the three quatrains and the couplet. Usually in Shakespeare, you'll find that the, the first 12, the 12 lines, they have the same problem, and again, the dilemma, and the complication, and the crisis, and then the resolution comes in two lines. But in this one, we kind of have a twist here early, a little bit early. The third uh, quatrain. Basically, yeah, for showing what, what, what's to come. But the couplet itself in Shakespeare is genius. 
We almost want to give up in 12 lines. There's no way out. For, for the Petrarchan sonnet, it takes six lines to get to the resolution, to give us some kind of a closure. But for Shakespeare, just two lines. Other people use the couplet in their sonnets, but not like what Shakespeare did here. A final point I want to highlight today is related to, to the meter of the poem. You know the meter? Al-Bahar, al-Wazn, music, the rhythm. So we said this is an iambic pentameter, iamb, uh, meaning like two syllables, one for unstressed and then stressed. Okay? And then uh, the penta, penta means five. So pentameter, because there are five feet, meaning ten, ten syllables. I found this online, people trying to force the iambic pentameter on Shakespeare's sonnet, and I don't think this is right, I think this is wrong. Giving it perfect rhyme, per perfect story, iams. Unstressed, can you see that some of this is written in bold? Okay, so shall I compare thee to a summer's day? But okay, you don't read it this way. But they say this is the natural English. By the way, almost 80%, this is something, a number I made up, of uh, uh, English poetry is iambic. Iambic tetrameter, iambic pentameter. So shall I compare thee to a summer's daily going down and up, down and up? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. This is perfect. Rough winds, I don't like this. Because rough is still a big word. So let's see how to do this. So usually we go for, listen, the nouns, the verbs are almost always stressed. The functional words, the prepositions, the articles, the determiners are almost always, not always, unstressed. Unless the poet wants to highlight something or emphasize something. Shall I? This is I, not an ordinary I. Basic, generally, it's not stressed, but this is shall I. Some people might say, no, this is unstressed, and they want to go, shall I compare? Shall I? Shall I? Shall I? Or shall I? Shall I? Compare the unstressed to also unstressed, but some people would go for stressed. Shall I compare the to a summer's day? So unstressed. Okay, stressed, answer. Look at the nouns and the, the, the verbs. If they are long, more than one syllable, then one is stressed and one is answered. Usually the ER, you know, the LY, whatever you add to the word, unstressed. They stressed. So again, some people like to go for a perfect iambic here. Shall I compare the to a sa must they? We'll see, yeah, we'll see this in a, in a bit. So going for I being stressed, V being unstressed. Who's more important here? A speaker, Shakespeare, the poet, the persona. And V, you still almost nothing. You are unstressed, unheard of. But again, notice how we could still differ and still be friends. So if you insist that too, because it's a preposition, it's unstressed, okay, no worries. No hard feelings. Thou, unstressed, art, possibly unstressed, or it could be also stressed. More, unstressed, love, stressed, li, unstressed, and unstressed, more stressed, unstressed. Here, okay. This is unstressed, and could be stressed, if you go for unstressed, it's okay. Uh, unstressed, stressed, unstressed, stressed. We call this I am. Hey, how do we say I am? This we call this an I am. Is any I am? Unstressed. Link the you. This thing with the unstressed. غير مشدد حرف غير مشدد. How do we say تفعيلة I am. 
Okay, I like this. I disagree with the guy who uh, did unstressed, stressed, unstressed, stressed here. Remember, he moved from the sweetness of the first scene to the toughness and roughness. So I think this is stressed, 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 stressed. So the way we read this should change. Rough winds, like even rough winds do shake. Because he's saying life is tough, life is difficult. When he said this, look at what he did. Number one, he used even the words in their meaning. The word rough is a tough word, right? How it sounds, rough. The rough sound, the f like the, the winds. And also the meter itself is connected. And I think this is deliberate. This is Shakespeare. So, rough winds do shake the darling buds of May. And you could go on and on. I like this. I don't want you to be confused here. I'll do it slowly. Uh, like We're not going to focus on the whole poem, just the things to make points. So, the point here is that the eye is almost definitely stressed. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day where the is unstressed. He's more important than her. And look at this. Rough winds, stressed, stressed, to indicate the toughness of life, the destructiveness of life. How nature is destructive to beauty. Do shake. And I'll, for the sake of time, I'll jump to the last bit of the poem. To do the same. The first line in the couplet is almost perfect. So long as men can breathe, all eyes can see. It's perfect. It's very musical. So titum, 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 titum. So long as men. Many people sing this. Go to YouTube and see how beautiful it can be rendered into song. So long as men can breathe, or eyes can see. Very musical. So long. I think this is lives is a verb. Stressed. Some people might want to insist that no, stressed, unstressed, stressed, unstressed. Stressed. A verb. It's a main verb. Should be stressed, and this could be unstressed. But this, he's saying this. So also. There is an emphasis here on this, my poetry. Lives this unstressed, stressed because of this again. Yeah, stressed. Also stressed, stressed because there is emphasis here. Unstressed and finally stressed. to thee. You could read it with a uh, falling down uh, intonation here. So long lives this and this gives life to thee. Or, so long lives this and this gives life to thee. And I think this should be the more appropriate reading. Shifting from the woman being unstressed, possibly unknown, small, almost nothing, and turned into this stressed woman everybody around the world is talking about. Growing and growing, eternal in his lines with a stressed line. So I could ask you a question. Why did Shakespeare start with a stressed D, an unstressed D, and ended with a stressed D? Linking the meter, this is something new to most of you, but we'll see how this can be developed. I'll give you maximum two minutes, because again, we don't have much time. So if, if you please be, be brief, Nadia. A rising intonation. The rising intonation is like being proud of himself. Of what he I made did. you what yeah. you are. Look at it. If you don't do the uh, the meter thing, you couldn't feel this this hidden beauty, the hidden treasures in in Shakespeare and other poetry. More brief. Possibly yes. Possibly, yes. Yeah, 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 sure. Listen, listen. This is the beauty of the meter. I know some of you like, are intimidated by the meter and something, but there are so many varieties. It depends on how you read things. But logically, lives should be stressed, and this shouldn't be stressed. But here he is. This is not an ordinary this. This is not this mobile or this 
thing I wrote. This is Shakespeare's writing. So if you go for stressed, unstressed, I would take it. If you go for unstressed, stressed, I would take it. If you go for stressed, I, I like to go for stressed, stressed. I wouldn't say no to you. Oh, it's not written in stone. It, like some, some people might argue, like if, if this is live from life, and he's saying this is emphasized while lives is not, making the point that Shakespeare's poetry outlives life, beats life, that's a perfect point. It's more important than life because it's going to outlive the transience of beauty and the destructiveness of time. One last point, please, somebody. Go. Um, can I ask about the thing that I'm talking to ask a poet's knowledge written or not? So here in Shakespeare, it's crystal clear that he's confident that he knows his greatness. Because somebody is saying that his poetry can defeat death, his poetry can freeze time. And no one could say that I can defeat death. Unless he or she is certain. That's a good point you're making there. Yep. But he knows that people will read. I think he kind of knows that. But that's a good point. Yeah, we make him great. Listen, this, is, this, this, is, this was probably a sonnet written in a small town somewhere in, in, in the UK. And now it's being read around the globe. We make... Like, you're making the point that we make Shakespeare. I think there is an argument for that. Who is Shakespeare? Shakespeare is the person I want to see. Some of you don't like Shakespeare. Some of you like... Shakespeare. But I hope that... This negativity is changing a little bit here. It's like, wow, look at what this man is doing. I'll stop here. Next class, we have an yet another sonnet by Shakespeare. Thank you very much.